or discerning of spirits, and to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the gift of interpretation of tongues. Remember, it's the same Holy Spirit who distributes, activates, and operates these gifts as he chooses in the believer. And so um, Paul is talking about the gifts, and then he goes on to talk about each gift and how they work and, and uh, teaches the church of Corinth about it. But one that I really want to focus on today is if you turn to uh, verse 27, uh, starting, um, yeah, 1227, it says, you are the body of the anointed one. You, every single one of us is a part of a body, Right? We're not on our own, but when you get saved, you're part of a living organism, and Jesus is the head, and we're a part, and we're together. So all of us are a part, and he said, each of you are unique and a vital part. Every single one of you, Jesus sees you as so vital and, and so unique that he needs every single one of us. Nobody else can fulfill what God has called you to fulfill. We need everyone to be a part and know how important and loved you are to be a part of this body that we can work. So he said there's first apostles and second prophets and third teachers and those who have gift of miracles and divine healings and gift of revelation. There's gifts of leadership. There's, there's those who are called to the helps ministry and the government of the church and serving in the church. Whether you're an apostle or serving in the church, it's such a vital part. And he has given all of the spiritual gifts to every single one of us to do what God has called us to do. And he said not everyone's an apostle or prophet or teacher. Not everyone performs miracles, gifts of healing, or speaking in tongues or interpretation, but you should all constantly, say constantly, constantly. boil over with passion and seeking the higher gifts. It means if you haven't walked in miracles yet, boil over with passion to walk in it, or prophecy, or words of knowledge, or whatever it is, because it's not you, it's the Holy Spirit in you that wants to use you. Okay, so the, the gift that I really want to focus on today is diversity of tongues. And uh, we'll kind of get into the different um, tongues, but Ephesians 6, 12, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers and the darkness of this world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, Paul said, I, I want to teach about the spiritual gifts and get rid of confusion because there, there's so much going on in the spiritual realm that you need the spiritual gifts to survive. And if you don't understand the spiritual gifts, well, you're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but about evil powers and darkness. But the Holy Spirit is bigger than any of that, and he lives in us. But if we can't activate what he's put in us, then we're kind of walking around blindly in this world. And so Paul is saying um, in the Ephesians, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but something that is bigger than earthly things. There's three heavens. There is the first heaven, and that's what we live on here, you know, that we see with our senses. But there's a second heaven, and this is where the principalities and the darkness of this world rule. The Bible says that Satan is the prince of this world, and he rules there with demons and darkness. Did you know that the spiritual realm is so much more real than this one? So much more real. And there's a war going on over our lives. You know, God has such a plan for our life, but I want to tell you something. The enemy does too. And it's a constant battle. We know about the second heavens. There's several scriptures that reference to it, but the one that I'm just going to bring up is Daniel when he's interceding, right? And there was a principality that came to stop his prayer from being fulfilled, going to the third heavens where Jesus rules and reigns. And so there's a battle going on. So sometimes we're interceding, we're praying, and we're like, why doesn't God hear us? Oh, he hears you, and he has sent angels to go. But sometimes there's a battle over our destiny, and we can't let go. We have to keep praying. We have to keep pushing through because we will always win. Here's the thing. Jesus actually already won, and that's in Revelation, and we're kind of just making our way back. 
So there is victory, so don't give up. But there's sometimes a war going on, and you're thinking, what did I do wrong, or is God mad? No, God's not mad. He's very well pleased with you. But there's a war over your life because you are powerful. You're a vital part of the kingdom. And we cannot submit to the things of this world, our five senses, the things we see, right? We were singing the song. I don't live by what I see or why I, what I feel because that is so surface. That, that's so carnal compared to what God has in the third heavens for us. He has things stored up for us that we have to pull down, but sometimes it has to go through the second heavens where there is such a battle over our lives. But we come from a place of victory. Turn with me to Ephesians 6.10. In Ephesians 6.10, Paul says, Now, my beloved ones, I save the most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious in the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. See, when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, there's an explosive power that flows in and out of us. And then uh, turn to, uh, we're already in Ephesians 6, but turn to 18. Verse 18, it says, Pray passionately in the Spirit as you intercede with every form of prayer at all times. Praying in the Spirit. And then Ephesians 5. Turn with me to, I told you we're going to read a lot of scripture. <laughs> I forewarned you. Ephesians 5, 15. It says, so be very careful how you live. Not being like those who have no understanding, but live honorably with true wisdom. For we are living in evil times. Take full advantage Here's the thing. There's so many times in this world, you're not supposed to take advantage of people or things. But this is one time we have permission to take full advantage of the kingdom. Jesus says, will you take advantage of me and all that I have for you so we can accomplish what I've called to accomplish? Because he's coming back for a victorious bride. So Paul says, take full advantage every day as you spend your life for his purposes. And don't live foolishly, for then you'll have no discernment to fully understand God's will. And don't get drunk with wine, which is re- uh, rebellion. But instead, be filled with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And your hearts will overflow with a joyful song to the Lord Jehovah. And so um, Paul says, I want you to passionately desire the gifts. And then he says to take full advantage of it. And let your passion boil over for the spiritual things. Because the spiritual things is what equips us for the things that God has for us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tongues. I wish I could talk about all of the gifts because I love all of the gifts. They are amazing and they're exciting. And maybe one day we'll talk about that soon. But today I'm going to talk about the diversity of tongues. When we read in 1 Corinthians, it said that he is given um, diversity of tongues. And there's four types of tongues. And I want to talk about this because I feel like the tongues is the most controversial of all of the gifts. It's so controversial that denominations have split over speaking in tongues. Yeah, okay, some people, okay, healing, all right, yeah, God can heal and this, but that tongue thing is so divisive. And it's so interesting because when you get spirit-filled, that is the first thing that is evident of the gifts. And, and I believe because speaking in tongues is so foundational. Um, so let, let, let me talk about the four kinds of tongues real quick, and then, and then I'm going to talk about praying in the Spirit. Um, there's tongues for interpretation. And that's when Paul was saying some speak in tongues and some may not. Where there's a gift of speaking in tongues. And that is for interpretation and that is for in the church. There is times, and I don't know if you've seen this, but somebody in the church will stand up and say something in tongues and then something, somebody will stand up and do interpretation. And Paul actually spends almost a whole chapter on how to do this right. 
Because here's the thing about speaking in tongues. It is so powerful. And if the enemy cannot get rid of it, he'll make us do it so weird and so much dysfunction that nobody wants to stay in the church <laughs> in disorder. And so Paul had to talk about it. Okay, here's how you do it in order. And you don't want to weird people out because unless you have an interpretation, it edifies nobody, right? There's no point of me standing up, speaking in tongues and no interpretation. You know, everybody's like, okay, good for you. You got edified because it's for self-edification, but that did nothing and pretty much took away from what God was doing. So there's a tongue for interpretation. And Paul said, just let two or three go and do it in order. And that is the gift of speaking in tongues with interpretation. That's the first one. The second one is tongues for deep intercession. And this is in Romans 8, 26 and 28. There's other references, but this is the one, this is the main one. So turn with me to Romans. I want to read this to you so you know where it's at. Romans 8, starting with verse 26. It says, um, in a similar way, the Holy Spirit takes a hold of us in our human frailty and empowers us in our weakness. For example, there are times we don't even know how to pray or know the best things to ask for, but the Holy Spirit rises up within us to super intercede. Like, not just to intercede, but it's super intercede. I love that. On our behalf, pleading with God with emotional sighs that are too deep for words. There is times when intercession comes upon us with, with us speaking and praying in tongues. It's with groanings and in intercession. It is unstoppable. I believe when you speak in tongues in church, you can stop it. Intercession rises up from inside and just comes out and he is interceding. This has happened to me two or three times in my life and twice I was driving, just minding my own business, driving to work and all of a sudden this emotional, heavy burden, groanings. I had to pull over my car, 15 minutes, I'm just interceding, interceding, tears, no idea what's going on. And then it lifts. I'm good. God's good. I don't know what happened. I, I asked God, tell me. I think if I needed to know, I would. Um, I remember my brother-in-law said it happened to him several times. But one time, it was like midnight. He's in bed, and this deep intercession came over him. And he is just crying in the spirit, wailing. And then he saw a picture of a little girl in China being raped. And God was using him for intercession over that little girl. Here's the thing is when we're submitted to the Lord, he can use us anytime, any way. And the Holy Spirit, he would have never known how to pray over that situation. But see, the Holy Spirit intercedes, super intercedes through us or for us to make intercessions, to make a way where there seems to be no way. And I promise you something amazing happened because he interceded. And then it just lifts. So that's Romans 8. That is, that is a, a tongue for deep intercession. And then three, um, there's tongues for a sign to the unbelievers. Paul talks about this, but also it's in Acts 2 where you speak another language. Now, I'm believing that I'm going to get this and speak Spanish. This is a tongue... <laughs> For another language. So you're, you don't know the language, but it's a known language on earth. Missionaries get this a lot. They go to a country. Here's the thing. You can go and, and you can learn the language and that is awesome. And a lot of denominations do that. But the denominations that believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you can get tongues with known language, it's a lot easier. I don't have to spend six months learning language. I can just have the Holy Spirit speak through me in tongues and I'm speaking another language. It's so much easier. God can use either. But this happened in Acts 2, 4. The disciples, the Holy Spirit fell on them. You know, what? let's just read it. Do I have time? Yeah, let's just read it real quick. Acts 2. This is awesome. And I would just love to like be up here 
you know, the 11 o'clock service, and I just start speaking, it just all comes out Spanish. Wouldn't that be so cool? My husband would really like that. Maybe that happened in Rocky Point. Okay, um, Acts 2, 4. Uh, I'm going to start with one. On the, day of Penteco- uh, on the day Pentecost was being fulfilled and all the disciples were gathered in one place, suddenly they heard a sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from the heavenly realm. This is from the third heavens. Roaring of the wind so overpowering that um, um, it was all anybody could bear. Then at once there was a pillar of fire appearing before their eyes and it separated into tongues of fire. It says tongues of fire. I do not know what that means. Did it look like a tongue? What does tongues of fire mean? But basically the fire separated over each individual above their head. And so there was separating the tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. And they were filled and equipped, say equipped, by the Spirit to speak languages they never learned. So then they walk out and they're speaking all these languages. Well, what happened? There were so many cultures and languages around. They were speaking the miracles and glory of God and the Word of God and the good news. And it says everybody could hear what was going on. What a cool gift, right? So in that day, so many people got saved because it wasn't just for the Jews. It's for Jews and Gentiles and men and women and children and everyone. And so that is the tongues assigned to the unbelievers. Now, if you were in another country and somebody didn't know the Lord and you started speaking their language, how much more would they come into the kingdom? The fourth tongue, which I'm going to kind of hit on today um, the most, is tongues for personal, personal edification. Because the baptism fills us and equips us. And when we get saved, we get a heavenly prayer language that we can pray any time we want to, as much as we want to. And what this means is this language is the language of the Holy Spirit. We do not know what we're saying. Can Holy Spirit give us interpretation? Yes. But sometimes he doesn't. And it says that he intercedes for us the perfect will of God. And, um, and, and we'll talk about some of um, examples in the Bible. The first one I want to turn to is Jude 20. And I say Jude 20 because there's only one book in Jude. So you just say Jude 20, and that's verse 20. Jude 1, 20. It says, but you, my delightfully loved friends, constantly and progressively build yourselves up on the foundation of your most holy faith by praying every moment in the Spirit. In another translation, it says, you build up your most holy faith by praying in the Spirit. We've all been given a measure of faith, but how we build up our faith is one hearing the word And then now Jude is saying, praying in the Spirit. And Paul said also in Ephesians, pray at all times, praying in the Spirit. Because you are building something up inside of you. Now when you get saved, when you ask Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. And we get a brand new nature. Like we're we're new, new creation, right? Brand new nature. But there's a second thing that happens, and it really should happen when you get saved, and that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You get baptized by water and baptized by the Holy Spirit because this is the power. This is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We have the nature of the Holy Spirit at salvation, but we need the power, the supercharge to walk out our destiny. I truly believe that the gift of praying in the Spirit is what moves us to our destiny. And I'm going to show you scriptures on why and why it's so powerful. But Judah's saying constantly because you're building up the faith inside of you. There's a foundation and you're building up what God has called you to do by praying in the Spirit. It's so powerful. I can pray for God's will to be done in my life. But it is so vague compared to the details that the Holy Spirit knows. I mean, he knows my whole life and what's going to come. So he can pray so much better than I can. It doesn't mean we don't pray with our words, 
But there needs to be a time, and I believe daily, that we are allowing the Holy Spirit to make intercession for us to work out the destiny that he has for us. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 3, it says that um, praying in the Spirit advances, and the spiritual gifts advances our spiritual process. The spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit and praying in the Spirit advances our spiritual process. That means when we're baby Christians and we don't know a lot and we haven't memorized a lot of the word, Holy Spirit will pray through us to start advancing us into the things and into maturity where God has called us. Acts 1.5, um, it talks about how um, John baptizes with water, but you still need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, 23, it says, Repent, for each of you have been baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. But now you will receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's two separate things. Acts 19, um, the apostles saw that people were saved, and they said, yeah, we've been baptized by water. And Paul said, but have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? No, not yet. Well, you need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. He started praying for them, and the first thing that was evident was speaking in tongues. They got their heavenly prayer language. I think when we pray in the Spirit in our heavenly prayer language and edify ourselves, it actually activates all of the other spiritual gifts into maturity. Because to prophesy and have words of wisdom and words of knowledge, there needs to be some sort of maturity that goes with it. Because why? Paul talks about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. And in 13, he says, but it's nothing without love. Love is character and it's maturity. And then it goes back into the spiritual gifts. If we have spiritual gifts, but we don't walk in love and in maturity, we can actually do more damage than good. And so when we're praying in the spirit, it's building up those things inside of us and faith. So when faith is there and there's a word of knowledge coming up and you're like, I don't know, is this God? Is it not God? There's faith that you've interceded for that says, yes, it is. And it just comes out and somebody's life has changed. So praying in the spirit builds up that most holy faith. So when something comes, the enemy can't take it away. He can't say, oh, you're not hearing from God. Don't do it. You're not qualified. You know nothing. And the whole, most holy faith is built up. You said, yes, I'm qualified because Jesus qualifies me. He qualifies us. None of us are qualified on our own merit, ever. It's the blood that qualifies us. Amen. Acts eleven sixteen is another one where they were saved, but they weren't baptized yet. Um. And so I want to talk about praying in the Spirit for personal edification. Let's turn to Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4, it talks about um, in verse, let's see where I want to go. Verse 7, it talks about... Um, and he has generously given us supernatural grace according to the size of the gift of Christ. It says that he ascended to the heavenly heights, taking many captives with him, and then he gave gifts to men. And he ascended means he returned to heaven. It's like Jesus returned to heaven. He got a bunch of gifts for us, and he came down and gave it to us to equip us is what it's talking about. And then the same scriptures that he said, the same thing he said in 1 Corinthians, Paul is repeating in Ephesians when he talks about there's apostles and prophets and, and all the different gifts. And Paul says, Jesus gave us the gifts to equip us and, and for our spiritual process. That's in, in uh, verse 11, it says he's appointed some grace to be apostles and prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and some to be teachers. Their calling is to nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do their works in ministry. As they will do this, it will enlarge and build up the body of Christ. The grace ministries will function 
as we attain oneness in the faith until we all experience the fullness of what it means to come into the Son of God. Finally, we become one, the perfect man with full dimension and spiritual maturity, fully developed in the abundance of Christ. And Ephesians 4 is the same thing that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 27 when it says that God has made apostles and prophets and the helps ministry and leadership and, and all of these things, and he's giving gifts to all of us for spiritual maturity and equipping. Um, Ephesians 1.11. Turn with me to Ephesians 1.11. It says, Through our union with Christ, we too have been claimed by God as his own inheritance. You're God's inheritance. He claims you as his own. On your worst day and your worst moment, God says, she's mine. He's mine. That's my inheritance I'm redeeming. Before we were even born, he gave us our destiny that we would fulfill the plans of God who always accomplishes every purpose and plan in his heart. Before you were born, God already had your destiny. He made plans about you. He dreamt about your life and what you would do for him. He destined it. And then he promises, God always fulfills what he says. He's not man that he should lie. You have a destiny over your life, and God longs for it to be fulfilled. Now, Ephesians 1.19. Go with me to Ephesians 1.19. It says, I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you, to us, through faith. And your lives will be an advertisement of the immense power as it works through you. Now, how do we know and find out our destiny? Well, that takes us back to 1 Corinthians 2.10. 1 Corinthians 2.10, it tells us, and I've read this, but I'm going to read it again because they go together. It says, God now unveils these profound realities to us by his spirit. Yes, he's revealed to us the inmost heart and the deepest min- min- um, mysteries through the Holy Spirit, who is constantly exploring all things. After all, who can really know what's in a person's heart and know his hidden impulses except for the person's spirit? So it is with God. His thoughts and secrets are only fulfilled, understood by the Spirit, the Spirit God. For we've not received the Spirit of this world system, but the Spirit of God, that we might come to understand and experience all that grace has lavished upon us. So what Paul is saying is, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has ordained for your life. Nobody can really know and understand God except for the Spirit of God. And he said, so for you to fully understand how good I am and what I have for you, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit because he knows every detail, every plan. You know that plan he made for you before the foundations of the earth, that plan? Holy Spirit was there. He's like, I got it. And then he comes and moves into us. And he said, whenever you want me to, I will pray out that perfect plan over your life. Whenever you want me to. But here's the thing. The kingdom is not passive. (laughs) It's not passive. We have to go after everything. Salvation, we choose. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, we choose. Everything Paul said, I hope you take advantage of it. I hope that you desire it. I want you to want this. But there's a wanting, there's a longing, and there's something that you actually have to go and take it. Because God gives us uh, free will. I can live this life with the nature of God saved and never walk in any power and not be very effective. Yes, I can tell people about the Lord, but Paul and the Lord said so many times, we need the gifts. If we didn't, he wouldn't have given to us. He actually says, we only need them for this earth. The gifts don't go with us in heaven because we don't need it in heaven. We come into fullness and understanding. But we don't know the fullness on this earth. We're still working with sometimes a carnal mindset that we have to get out of ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to intercede through us. It's like 
it's the safe bet. <laughs> I love it because it's like we have a destiny and we can go for it, but if we're messing it up, the Holy Spirit is there to direct us, intercede for us, and help us to get back on track. Amen. Um, turn with me back to Romans. I know we're going back and forth, but it's so good, and I have to read this. Romans 8. Holy Spirit knows every single detail, knows God's heart and his passion for your life. And he wants to intercede for us. So Romans 8. I read this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read um, 8, 27 and 28. Listen to this. God, the searcher of the heart, knows fully our longings. Yet he also understands the desire of the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. When we are praying in the Spirit, it's perfect harmony for God's plan and our destiny. Some people say, I don't know what God's plan is for my life. Baby Christians, you just come. You're saved and you have no idea what God has called you to do. The Holy Spirit does. That's why we get the gift of tongues. That's why that's the first thing that is evident in the gifts because he will intercede to get you there to show you what the plans are. We need him to intercede because he is in perfect harmony with God. Sometimes we pray. I don't know if this happened to you, but sometimes we pray and it's not in harmony with God, right? I mean, our heart's pure, but it's not quite what God wants for our lives. You know, I I was dating somebody and almost married him because I thought it was God's will for my life, and I was praying over that relationship. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. So I'm not going to answer that one. That's not according to the perfect harmony that I have for you. Praise God for the Holy Spirit to take us where he needs to get us to build up the most holy faith, the foundation. Um, My dad... um, Both my parents grew up in a a rough, rough upbringing. Um, There are stories that my dad starts saying, and I'm like, Dad, I don't want to hear it. It breaks my heart, the abuse and the things that they've been through. And and they've overcome so much. But one of the, um, a powerful memory I have, I have so many powerful memories of my parents because they were first-generation Christians. They're pioneers going through every obstacle so us kids could just walk in the pathway. It has been so much easier for us as their kids because they did the hard work. They got rid of the strongholds and the, and the things that, that were before and that just made, paved a way for us. Do you know what I'm talking about? Your victories is going to be so much easier for your kids. Every time I got in the car with my dad, almost every time, he was always praying in the spirit, Always. It had become so second nature to him, he didn't even know he was doing it. Like, we'd be talking, and then he would just be praying in the Spirit. So I, w- I was um, preaching to my kids Wednesday. We are driving in the car, and I was like, do you know how powerful it is praying in the Spirit? We're all going to pray in the Spirit right now. So we all start praying in the Spirit, you know, and here's Victoria, too. She doesn't know what we're doing, so she's just yelling out anything. But she's experiencing it, you know. And I said, every time I got in the car with my dad, he was just praying in the Spirit. And Caden said, yes. Papa's always praying in the spirit. But here's the thing. When my dad got saved, he had nobody to show him the way. His dad drank himself to death at 40. His mom was so abusive. All he had was the Holy Spirit to make intercession for him. And he would just pray in the spirit. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to be a Christian. I know how to sin real well. But the Holy Spirit had to get all that stuff out of him. He had so much anger and so much hurt and so much resentment. And the Holy Spirit was just interceding through him, getting all that junk out. He's a pastor today. Because Holy Spirit knew his destiny, the plans that he had for him that not only involved him, but his children and his grandkids and everybody else that's involved because he yielded to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we don't know how to pray, but don't worry, the Holy Spirit does. We need to daily be praying in the Spirit.
Spirit making intercession because he knows what's going to happen that afternoon, that night, the next day, and he's going to prepare us. 1 Corinthians 3. Oh, I'm going to end with this. Well, a few more things. Hold on. 1 Corinthians 3. Paul, this is before Paul's giving the spiritual gifts, and he said, he told, told the church of Corinth, why are you acting like people without the Spirit? You, you are being dominated by your mindset. And he said, you don't have to be. You don't have to be a slave to the sinful nature because the sinful nature is dead. The Bible says it's dead, but we like to resurrect it and then follow it around with chains like we're bound to sin. We're not bound to sin. Jesus took care of all of that. He said, why are you acting that way when you can be ruled by the Spirit, by the gifts of the Spirit? Matthew 24, 24, um, it talks about how false prophets will appear performing great signs and miracles. And it says in verse 24, even the elect could be deceived. Okay, this is the end times that, that Jesus is talking about. And we are in the end times. You want to know why? Because he's coming back. We're just waiting for the rapture. I believe in the rapture and the second coming of Christ. Those are two separate events I won't teach on. But we're waiting for the rapture. But he said, as times go, there's going to be false prophets and even people that say, oh, Jesus is over here. Oh, Jesus is over there. And everybody's like, ah, yay. And there's going to be signs and wonders, miracles that are going to happen. How are we supposed to know what's true or not true? Holy Spirit. The discernment of spirits. It's a gift. We have to carry the discernment. He said even the elect, the ones that go to church every day, the one who knows the word, could be deceived. But you have the Holy Spirit. We don't have to fear. Holy Spirit's going to show us, eh, that might look real and powerful, and they might yell a lot. <laughs> it's not me. Just walk away. We don't have to worry with the gifts of the Spirit. It might get out of hand. Well, what if it's a wrong spirit? Well, I'd rather just throw it all away than have to deal with that. But that's fear. We have the Holy Spirit that will show us that person's not operating in my spirit. It might look glorified. It might look powerful, but it's not me. And we can trust that and walk away that we don't have to be deceived. Praying in the Spirit. Remember, there's four types. But praying in the Spirit for personal edification is what equips you. Equips you. It's what matures you. It's not the only way, but it's a really good way because God's interceding for you. He's interceding for you. Can you think of a better intercessor? I'm so thankful for Carlos and Nana and Maria and Margarita and those who come and intercede for us every morning, Monday through Friday. They come 6 o'clock every morning interceding for us. I'm so thankful, Carlos. I'm so thankful. Prayer is so powerful. But we have one who's making intercession for us. Jesus is making intercession for us. And when we want, when we want, Holy Spirit will. But we have to want him. And we have to ask him. We have to allow him. And we have to pray in the Spirit. And every time you're praying in the Spirit, your mind does not know what's going on. It is the most unreligious thing because it's not any works, right? Like my best prayer on the best day does not compare to what the Holy Spirit's doing. I am folding laundry, cleaning toilets, praying in the Spirit. Because my mind doesn't have to know. He's interceding for me. I'm just the vessel. So I multitask. Well, I'm a mom of five, so I have to multitask. I remember when we got saved and the babies kept coming. We had three babies in three years, three and a half years. We got saved or married? Yeah, married. Did I say saved? <laughs> we were saved and married. <laughs> Two good things. They married. We had three babies in three and a half years, so I was busy. And I was used to, you know, spending hours with the Lord. I could pray and read my, you know, single life is awesome. It's awesome when you know God. And we just went on dates. And I just loved my time with Jesus. Marriage is awesome too. It's just different. And so I remember like, God, I just don't have enough time. I feel so like dry. He said, pray in the spirit, Kara. 
pray in the Spirit. At all times, on all occasions, Paul said, pray in the Spirit. So you are interceding. I am fulfilling my destiny, praying for my destiny, the good works that God has ordained for me. While I'm doing mommy things, I'm cleaning house, I'm cooking dinner. That's what's so cool about praying in the Spirit. It's, it's so almost unspiritual because it's not about me. It's nothing I'm doing. It's totally Holy Spirit in my life. Um, one thing, I, I didn't write down this scripture, but I want to read this scripture. I'm going to close with this. Hey, if you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, Ben and I and Carlos and, and uh, Sean and Lisa, our leadership, will be here for you. It's for everyone. Paul said, I want all of you to long and desire. Maybe you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit a long time ago, but you feel like it's not activated. Let's just activate it again today and stir it up. Um, Let me just read one thing for you real quick. Even before you were born. Oh, this is Ephesians 2, verse 10. We have become the poetry, the recreated people that will fulfill the destiny has given each one of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, this is a separate scripture. Paul already said this in Ephesians 1. Even before you were born, God set your destiny. And then he says it again. Remember, before you were even born, God knows your destiny. It says that God planned in advance our destiny in the good works. Say good works good works that we would fulfill. There is good works that God wrote down before you were born that only you could fulfill. He said, wow, Joseph is going to do this. And Sean is going to do this. And Lisa is going to do this. And Rocio is going to do this. And, And he wrote down all of the good works that we would fulfill. But it takes the Holy Spirit interceding through us. It takes the gifts to fulfill all of the things that he's created for us to do. I want to get to heaven. And God said, here's your checklist. You did everything. Wouldn't that be so cool? And some people's like, well, I didn't get saved until way, I was way older. God redeems time. He will somehow go back to your past, bring the opportunity to your future so you can fulfill it. He can do that. It's so amazing. There's no regret in the kingdom. He redeems all things. He restores all things. He fixes all things. He heals all things. He beautifies all things. He perfects all things. It's so amazing. It's so amazing. We need the gifts. The church needs the power again. We need to believe and we want it. We need to passionately desire it. Not if you want to use me, God. Use me, God. Use me, God. People are dying. People are lost. There's sickness all over. Cancer's taking over. We are the answer. You are the answer. It's not the apostle and the prophet and the pastor. It's every single one of us. He said every single one of us has to work together. He loves us working together in unity. And it's just believing the Holy Spirit.